So we've come through these 40 days of Lent. And if we were serious about the journey, then we realize we've been led from darkness into light, walking and recognizing the darkness of our own sin, contemplating it, its consequences upon our very lives and upon the lives of others. And now we walk into the brightness of Easter. We are walking from the deep sadness into overwhelming joy. The contrast cannot be any more startling. But all our Easter readings reflect this. So if you were with us last night, we had a whole series of readings from the Old Testament, beginning with Genesis, uh, walking through Exodus, Isaiah, Paul, to letter to the Roman, and the Gospel of Mark. They all reflect this tremendous contrast in the book of Genesis. We hear the story of creation from chaos and darkness and nothingness. God creates this magnificent universe, this beautiful creation, the gift of our world and the gift of you and me in all its beauty and wonder from this emptiness to life. In the book of Exodus, we hear of a people enslaved. The Israelite people are in Egypt, enslaved by the Pharaoh. They are less than nobodies to Pharaoh. And with the Lord coming, they, he transforms them, forms them into a people now belonging to God himself. We hear of their walking from doubt in darkness and despair to faith and freedom. And the experience of their journey through the Red Sea from death to life. How frightening it must have been. How joyous was their conclusion. From the prophet Isaiah, we heard of one dying of thirst, now being fully quenched with refreshing water one who lives in poverty now in the joy of wealth. One who was accused of sin, now totally forgiven. And of a land that is a desert transformed into a flourishing garden. Even Paul to the Romans speaks of the waters of baptism. And baptism plunges us into death. Christ's death, those waters where we are drowned and we are brought out of the waters into new life as sons and daughters of God. How dramatic. The Lord is very dramatic. He isn't subtle. He wants us to know very clearly a point that he's trying to make. But the gospel story is even more startling. Those who tortured and killed Jesus wanted to be sure that he was humiliated to nothingness. They whipped him so badly. And the Romans did this purposely, so to put fear into the hearts and minds of anyone who looked upon someone who was whipped by the Romans. They stripped him of every dignity. They hung him on a cross to increase his suffering, and then after he died, they pierced him with a sword, so to be absolutely certain that he was dead, and that his disciples knew there was nothing left of this Jesus. Those apostles and those who loved him and followed Jesus, having witnessed all of this, what happened to our Lord, we're in such despair, such disillusionment. They were grieving so deeply and weeping over the fact that they betrayed him. How dark was that night? They carried this for three days. Can you imagine the overwhelming darkness they felt? But imagine that Easter morning. 
such a contrast. Now it was a brilliant sunshine, a beautiful morning, bright and shining, filled with the joy of the Lord resurrected, a day filled with hope. It's always this way. <clears throat> the deepest joys are only experienced when we know the deepest sadness. The people in our world who know the deepest joys are the poorest of the poor. If you've ever been to a poor country, you see the joy in their hearts and their lives. They have nothing, but they know they have everything. <clears throat> We too often fail to appreciate the wonders and beauties that are around us. And typically it's because they're always around us. We take it for granted. And we've all experienced in our childhood and even in our adulthood, somebody dies, the person that you love so deeply is gone. And now you really start to consider how much you appreciated them. Or when mom and dad take that toy away from you as a child and how much you now realize how important that was for you, how much you now want it. <clears throat> Why is it that things have to be taken away from us before we really start to appreciate what we have? Let's appreciate the things we have while we still have them. That is what it means to live in the Easter joy. Every day is a day of appreciation. Every day is a new day given to you and I. So let us pray that the Lord not only fill us with a deeper appreciation for his eternal blessings, especially as we're gathered here, thanking God for his self-sacrifice that he offered, so to save you and me to be grateful for the gift of his resurrection and our own promised resurrection if we stay faithful to the Lord. To be grateful for the great hope that we now live in. And be grateful for the wonderful gift of each other, the gift of the faith that we help each other journey in. And as we walk to the kingdom together, we cannot do it alone nor could those disciples do it alone. So let us choose to live every day as if it's a new gift of life. The resurrection changes everything. Everything. So now when we make the sacrifice of our life and we unite it to Jesus and his sacrifice, because that's what we do here, we unite whole, the whole gift of our life, we unite it to Jesus' sacrifice, and now we become one with the Lord in his glory. That's what Eucharist is all about. That's what living in the Easter joy, to be an Easter people, is to live in the glory of the Lord. Not running back to the darkness or the cave, as I spoke about earlier and a few weeks ago. Not going back to the sin but choosing to live in the Lord, to live in his glory, to live as sons and daughters of God. That's what we're invited to today. And I thank God for the gift of each of you who encourage me in my own journeys of faith that we truly be sons and daughters of God. God bless you. <clears throat>